The Lumber Room by Hector Munro, popularly known as Saki. The children were to be driven as a special treat to the sands at Jagboro. Nicholas was not to be of the party. He was in disgrace. Only that morning he had refused to eat his wholesome bread and milk on the seemingly frivolous ground that there was a frog in it. Older and wiser and better people had told him that there could not possibly be a frog in his bread and milk and that he was not to talk nonsense. He continued nevertheless to talk what seemed the veriest nonsense and described with much detail the coloration and the markings of the alleged frog. The dramatic part of the incident was that there really was a frog in Nicholas's basin of bread and milk. He had put it there himself. So he felt entitled to know something about it. The sin of taking a frog from the garden and putting it into a bowl of wholesome bread and milk was enlarged on at great length. But the fact that stood out clearest in the whole affair as it presented itself to the mind of Nicholas was that the older, wiser and better people had been proved to be profoundly in error in matters about which they had expressed the utmost assurance. You said there couldn't possibly be a frog in my bread and milk. There was a frog in my bread and milk, he repeated, with the insistence of a skilled tactician who does not intend to shift from favourable ground. So, his boy cousin and girl cousin and his quite uninteresting younger brother were to be taken to Jack Burrow's sands that afternoon and he was to stay at home. His cousin's aunt, who insisted by an unwarranted stretch of imagination in styling herself his aunt also had hastily invented the Jack Burrow expedition in order to impress on Nicholas the delights that he had justly forfeited by his disgraceful conduct at the breakfast table. It was her habit, whenever one of the children fell from grace, to improvise something of a festival nature from which the offender would be rigorously debarred. If all these children sinned collectively, they were suddenly informed of a circus in a neighbouring town, a circus of unrivalled merit and uncounted elephants, to which, but for their depravity, they would have been taken that very day. A few decent tears were looked for on the part of Nicholas when the moment of the departure of the expedition arrived. As a matter of fact, however, all the crying was done by his girl cousin, who scraped her knee rather painfully against the step of the carriage as she was scrambling in. How she did howl, said Nicholas cheerfully, as the party drove off without any of the elation of high spirits that should have characterised it. She'll soon get over that said the soy descent aunt. It will be a glorious afternoon for racing about over those beautiful sands. How they will enjoy themselves. Bobby won't enjoy himself much, and he won't race much either, said Nicholas with a grim chuckle. <laughs> His boots are hurting him. They're too tight. Why didn't he tell me they were hurting? asked the aunt with some asperity. He told you twice, but you weren't listening. You often don't listen when we tell you important things. You are not to go into the gooseberry garden, said the aunt, changing the subject. Why not? demanded Nicholas. Because you are in disgrace, said the aunt loftily. Nicholas did not admit the flawlessness of the reasoning. He felt perfectly capable of being in disgrace and in a gooseberry garden at the same moment. His face took on an expression of considerable obstinacy. It was clear to his aunt that he was determined to get into the gooseberry garden. Only, as she remarked to herself, because I have told him he is not to. Now, the gooseberry garden had two doors by which it might be entered 
and once a small person like Nicholas could slip in there, he could effectually disappear from view. Amid the masking growth of artichokes, raspberry canes, and fruit bushes. The aunt had many other things to do that afternoon, but she spent an hour or two in trivial gardening operations among flower beds and shrubberies, whence she could watch the two doors that led to the forbidden paradise. She was a woman of few ideas with immense powers of concentration. Nicholas made one or two sorties into the front garden, wriggling his way with obvious stealth of purpose towards one or the other of the doors, but never for a moment, but never able for a moment to evade the aunt's watchful eye. As a matter of fact, he had no intention of trying to get into the gooseberry garden, but it was extremely convenient for him that his aunt should believe that he had. It was a belief that would keep her on self-imposed sentry duty for the greater part of the afternoon. Having thoroughly confirmed and fortified her suspicions, Nicholas slipped back into the house and rapidly put into execution a plan of action that had long germinated in his brain. By standing on a chair in the library, one could reach a shelf on which reposed a fat, important-looking key. The key was as important as it looked. It was the instrument which kept the mysteries of the lumber room secure from unauthorized intrusion, which opened a way only for aunts and such like privileged persons. Nicholas had not had much experience of the art of fitting keys into keyholes and turning locks, but for some days past he had practiced with the key of the schoolroom door. He did not believe in trusting too much to luck and accident. The key turned stiffly in the lock, but it turned. The door opened, and Nicholas was in an unknown land, compared with which the gooseberry garden was a stale delight, a mere material pleasure. Often and often Nicholas's picture to himself what the lumber room might be like, that region that was so carefully sealed from youthful eyes, and concerning which no questions were ever answered. It came up to his expectations. In the first place, it was large and dimly lit, one high window opening into the forbidden garden, being its only source of illumination. In the second place, it was a storehouse of unimagined treasures. The aunt by assertion was one of those people who think that things spoil by use and consign them to dust and damp by way of preserving them. Such parts of the house, as Nicholas knew best, were rather bare and cheerless. But here, there were wonderful things for the eye to feast on. First and foremost, there was a piece of framed tapestry that was evidently meant to be a fire screen. To Nicholas, it was a living, breathing story. He sat down on a roll of Indian hangings glowing in wonderful colours beneath a layer of dust and took in all the details of the tapestry picture. A man dressed in the hunting costume of some remote period had just transfixed a stag with an arrow. It could not have been a difficult shot because the stag was only one or two paces away from him. In the thickly growing vegetation that the picture suggested, it would not have been difficult to creep up to a feeding stag. And the two spotted dogs that were springing forward to join in the chase had evidently been trained to keep to heel till the arrow was discharged. That part of the picture was simple, if interesting. But did the huntsman see what Nicholas saw? That four galloping wolves were coming in his direction through the wood? There might be more than four of them hidden behind the trees. And, in any case, would the man and his dogs be able to cope with the four wolves if they made an attack? The man had only two arrows left in his quiver, and he might miss with one or both of them. All one knew about his skill in shooting was that he could hit a large stag at a ridiculously short range. Nicholas sat for many golden minutes, revolving the possibilities of the scene. 
he was inclined to think that there were more than four wolves and the man and his dogs were in a tight corner but there were other objects of delight and interest claiming his instant attention there were quaint twisted candlesticks in the shape of snakes and a teapot fashioned like a china duck out of whose open beak the tea was supposed to come <sighs> how dull and shapeless the nursery teapot seemed in comparison and there was a carved sandalwood box packed tight with aromatic cotton wool and between the layers of cotton wool were little brass figures hump-necked bulls and peacocks and goblins delightful to see and to handle less promising in appearance was a large square book with plain black covers nicholas peeped into it and behold it was full of colored pictures of birds and such birds in the garden and in the lanes where he went for a walk nicholas came across a few birds of which the largest were an occasional magpie or wood pigeon here were herons and bustards kites toucans tiger bitterns brush turkeys ibises golden pheasants a whole portrait gallery of undreamed of creatures and as he was admiring the coloring of a mandarin duck and assigning a life history to it the voice of his garden in shrill vociferation of his name came from the gooseberry garden without she had grown suspicious at his long disappearance and had leapt to the conclusion that he had climbed over the wall behind the sheltering screen of lilac bushes she was now engaged in energetic and rather hopeless search for him among the artichokes and raspberry canes nicholas nicholas she screamed you are to come out of this at once there is no use trying to hide there i can see you all the time it was probably the first time for 20 years that any one had smiled in that lumber room presently the angry repetitions of nicholas's name gave way to a shriek and a cry for somebody to come quickly nicholas shut the book restored it carefully to its place in a corner and shook some dust from a neighboring pile of newspapers over it then he crept from the room locked the door and replaced the key exactly where he had found it his aunt was still calling his name when he sauntered into the front garden who's calling he asked me came the answer from the other side of the wall didn't you hear me i've been looking for you in the gooseberry garden and i've slipped into the drain water tank luckily there's no water in it but the sides are slippery and i can't get out fetch the little ladder from under the cherry tree i was told i wasn't to go into the gooseberry garden said nicholas promptly i told you not to and now i tell you that you may came the voice from the rain water tank rather impatiently your voice doesn't sound like aunt's objected nicholas you may be the evil one tempting me to be disobedient aunt often tells me that the evil one tempts me and that i always yield this time i'm not going to yield don't talk nonsense said the prisoner in the tank go and fetch the ladder will there be strawberry jam for tea asked nicholas innocently certainly there will be said the aunt privately resolving that nicholas should have none of it now i know you are the evil one and not aunt shouted nicholas gleefully when we asked aunt for strawberry jam yesterday she said there wasn't any i know there are four jars of it i know there are four jars of it in the store cupboard because i looked and of course you know it's there but she doesn't because she said there wasn't any oh devil you sold yourself there was an unusual sense of luxury in being able to talk to an aunt as though one was talking to the evil one but nicholas knew with childish discernment that such luxuries were not to be over indulged in he walked noisily away and it was a kitchen maid in search of parsley who eventually rescued the aunt from the rain water tank tea that evening was partaken of in a fearsome silence the tide had been at its highest when the children had arrived at jagborough cove so there had been no sands to play on 
a circumstance that aunt had overlooked in the haste of organizing her punitive expedition the tightness of bobby's boots had had a disastrous effect on his temper the whole of the afternoon and altogether the children could not have been said to have enjoyed themselves the aunt maintained the frozen muteness of one who has suffered undignified and unmerited detention in a rainwater tank for thirty-five minutes as for nicholas he too was silent in the absorption of one who has much to think about it was just possible he considered that the huntsman would escape with his hounds while the wolves feasted on the stricken stag end of the lumber room by saki The Madness of Andalsprutz by Lord Dunsany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit us at LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in September 2018. I first saw the city of Andalsprutz on an afternoon in spring. The day was full of sunshine as I came by the way of the fields, and all the morning I had said, There will be sunlight on it when I see for the first time the beautiful conquered city, whose fame has so often made for me lovely dreams. Suddenly I saw its fortifications lifting out of the fields, and behind them stood its belfries. I went in by a gate and saw its houses and streets, and a great disappointment came upon me for there is an air about a city and it has a way with it whereby a man may recognize one from another at once there are cities full of happiness and cities full of pleasure and cities full of gloom there are cities with their faces to heaven and some with their faces to earth some have a way of looking at the past and others look at the future some notice you if you come among them others glance at you others let you go by some love the cities that are their neighbors others are dear to the plains and to the heath some cities are bare to the wind others have purple cloaks and others brown cloaks and some are clad in white some tell the old tales of their infancy with others it is secret some cities sing and some mutter some are angry and some have broken hearts and each city has her way of greeting time. I had said, I will see Andalsprutz arrogant with her beauty, and I had said, I will see her weeping over her conquest. I had said, she will sing songs to me, and she will be reticent, and she will be all robed, and she will be bare but splendid. But the windows of Andalsprutz in her houses looked vacantly over the plains like the eyes of a dead madman. At the hour her chimes sounded unlovely and discordant, some of them were out of tune, and the bells of some were cracked. Her roofs were bald and without moss. At evening no pleasant rumor arose in her streets. When the lamps were lit in the houses no mystical flood of light stole out into the dusk you merely saw that there were lighted lamps. Andalsprutz had no way with her, and no air about her. When the night fell and the blinds were all drawn down, then I perceived what I had not thought in the daylight. I knew then that Andalsprutz was dead. I saw a fair-haired man who drank beer in a cafe, and I said to him, Why is the city of Andalsprutz quite dead, and her soul gone hence? He answered, Cities do not have souls, and there is never any life in bricks. And I said to him, Sir, you have spoken truly. And I asked the same question of another man, and he gave me the same answer, and I thanked him for his courtesy. And I saw a man of a more slender build, who had black hair, and channels in his cheeks for tears to run in, and I said to him, why is Andalsprutz quite dead, and when did her soul go hence? And he answered, Andalsprutz hoped too much. For thirty years she would stretch out her arms toward the land of Akla every night, to Mother Akla from whom she had been stolen. 
every night she would be hoping and sighing and stretching out her arms to mother akla at midnight once a year on the anniversary of the terrible day akla would send spies to lay a wreath against the walls of andelsbrutz she could do no more and on this night once in every year i used to weep for weeping was the mood of the city that nursed me every night while other cities slept did andelsbrutz sit brooding here and hoping till thirty wreaths lay mouldering by her walls and still the armies of akla could not come but after she had hoped so long and on the night that faithful spies had brought her thirtieth wreath andelsbrutz went suddenly mad all the bells clanged hideously in the belfries horses bolted in the streets the dogs all howled the stolid conquerors awoke and turned in their beds and slept again and i saw the grey shadowy form of endelspruits rise up decking her hair with the phantasms of cathedrals and stride away from her city and the great shadowy form that was the soul of Andelspruits went away muttering to the mountains, and there I followed her, for had she not been my nurse? Yes, I went away alone into the mountains, and for three days, wrapped in a cloak, I slept in their misty solitudes. I had no food to eat, and to drink I had only the water of the mountain streams. By day no living thing was near to me, and I heard nothing but the noise of the wind and the mountain streams roaring. But for three nights I heard all around me on the mountain the sounds of a great city. I saw the lights of tall cathedral windows flash momentarily on the peaks, and at times the glimmering lantern of some fortress patrol. And I saw the huge misty outline of the soul of Endelspruits sitting decked with her ghostly cathedrals, speaking to herself, with her eyes fixed before her in a mad stare, telling of ancient wars. And her confused speech for all those nights upon the mountain was sometimes the voice of traffic, and then of church bells, and then of bugles, but oftenest it was the voice of red war, and it was all incoherent, and she was quite mad the third night it rained heavily all night long but i stayed up there to watch the soul of my native city and she still sat staring straight before her raving but her voice was gentler now there were more chimes in it and occasional song midnight passed and the rain still swept down on me and still the solitudes of the mountain were full of mutterings of the poor mad city and the hours after midnight came the cold hours wherein sick men die suddenly i was aware of great shapes moving in the rain and heard the sound of voices that were not of my city nor yet of any that i ever knew and presently i discerned though faintly the souls of the great concourse of cities all bending over Andelspruits and comforting her and the ravines of the mountains roared that night with the voices of cities that had lain still for centuries for there came the soul of camelot that had so long ago forsaken usk and there was ilion all girt with towers still cursing the sweet face of ruinous helen and i saw there babylon and persepolis and the bearded face of bull like nineveh and athens mourned her immortal gods all these souls of cities that were dead spoke that night on the mountain to my city and soothed her until at last she muttered of war no longer and her eyes stared wildly no more but she hid her face in her hands and for some while wept softly at last she arose and walked slowly with bended head and leaning upon ilion and carthage went mournfully eastwards and the dust of her highway swirled behind her as she went a ghostly dust that never turned to mud in all that drenching rain and so the souls of the cities led her away and gradually they disappeared from the mountain and the ancient voices died away in the distance now since then i have seen my city alive but once i met a traveller who said that somewhere in the midst of a great desert are gathered together the souls of all dead cities he said that he was lost once in a place where there was no water and he heard their voices speaking all the night but i said i was once without water in a desert and heard a city speaking to me 
but knew not whether it really spoke to me or not for on that day i heard so many terrible things and only some of them were true and the man with the black hair said i believe it to be true though whither she went i know not i only know that the shepherd found me in the morning faint with hunger and cold and carried me down here and when i came to andelspruits it was as you have perceived it dead and thus ends the madness of andelspruits by lord Densany. of the management of the soul from gesta romanarum or entertaining moral stories volume one edited by rev charles swan published in eighteen twenty four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org of the management of the soul the emperor vespasian lived a long time without children but at last by the counsel of certain wise men he espoused a beautiful girl brought to him from a distant country he afterwards travelled with her into foreign lands and there became father of a son in the course of time he wished to revisit his own kingdom but his wife obstinately refused to comply and said if you leave me i will kill myself the emperor therefore in his dilemma constructed two rings and upon the jewels with which they were richly ornamented he sculptured images possessing very singular virtues one bore an effigy of memory and the other an effigy of oblivion they were placed upon the apex of each ring and that which represented oblivion he bestowed upon his wife the other he retained himself and as their love had been such was the power of the rings the wife presently forgot her husband and the husband cared but little for the memory of his wife seeing therefore that his object was achieved he departed joyfully to his own dominions and never afterwards returned to the lady so he ended his days in peace application my beloved by the emperor understand the human soul which ought to return to its own country that is to heaven by which path alone it can arrive at security therefore the psalmist says save me o god etc the wife is our body which holds the soul in sensual delights that encumber and bar its passage to that eternal life where the empire and hope of the soul is and why does it so impede it because the flesh rebels against the spirit and the spirit wars against the flesh do ye therefore as the emperor did make ye two rings the rings of memory and forgetfulness which are prayer and fasting for both are effective in most countries a ring upon a woman's finger is a token of her marriage and when a man resigns himself to prayer and fasting it is evidence of his being the bride of christ prayer is the ring of memory for the apostle enjoins us to pray without ceasing man therefore makes use of periodical prayer that god may remember his desires while angels themselves present and aid the petition as we read in the book of tobit fasting may be called the ring of oblivion because it withdraws from and forgets the enticements of the flesh that there may be no obstruction in its progress to god let us then study to preserve these rings and merit everlasting life End of Of the Management of the Soul From Justa Romanorum or Entertaining Moral Stories, Volume 1 Collected by Rev. Charles Swan in 1824「The McWilliamses and the Burglar Alarm » by Mark Twain This is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The conversation drifted smoothly and pleasantly along from weather to crops, from crops to literature, from literature to scandal, from scandal to religion, then took a random jump and landed on the subject of burglar alarms. And now, for the first time, Mr. McWilliams showed feeling. Whenever I perceive this sign on this man's dial, I comprehend it and lapse into silence and give him opportunity to unload his heart. Said he, with but ill-controlled emotion, I do not go one single cent on burglar alarms, Mr. Twain, not a single cent and i will tell you why when we were finishing our house we found we had a little cash left over on account of the plumber not knowing it i was for enlightening the heathen with it for i was always unaccountably down on the heathen somehow but mrs mcwilliams said no let's have a burglar alarm i agreed to this compromise i will explain that whenever i want a thing and mrs mcwilliams wants another thing and we decide upon the thing that mrs mcwilliams wants as we always do she calls that a compromise very well the man came up from new york and put in the alarm and charged three hundred and twenty-five dollars for it and said we could sleep without uneasiness now so we did for a while say a month then one night we smelled smoke and i was advised to get up and see what the matter was i lit a candle and started toward the stairs and met a burglar coming out of a room with a basket of tinware which he had mistaken for solid silver in the dark he was smoking a pipe i said my friend we do not allow smoking in this room he said he was a stranger and could not be expected to know the rules of the house said he had been in many houses just as good as this one and had never been objected to before he added that as far as his experience went such rules had never been considered to apply to burglars anyway i said smoke along then if it is the custom though i think that conceding of a privilege to a burglar which is denied to a bishop is a conspicuous sign of the looseness of the times but waving all that what business have you to be entering this house in this furtive and clandestine way without ringing the burglar alarm he looked confused and ashamed and said with embarrassment i beg a thousand pardons i did not know you had a burglar alarm else i would have rung it i beg you will not mention it where my parents may hear of it for they are old and feeble and such a seemingly wanton breach of the hallowed conventionalities of our christian civilization might all too rudely sunder the frail bridge which hangs darkling between the pale and evanescent present and the solemn great deeps of the eternities may i trouble you for a match i said your sentiments do you honour but if you will allow me to say it metaphor is not your best hold spare your thigh this kind light only on the box and seldom there in fact if my experience may be trusted but to return to business how did you get in here through a second story window it was even so i redeemed the tinware at pawnbroker's rates less cost of advertising bade the burglar good night closed the window after him and retired to headquarters to report next morning we sent for the burglar alarm man and he came up and explained that the reason the alarm did not go off was that no part of the house but the first floor was attached to the alarm this was simply idiotic one might as well have no armor on at all in battle as to have it only on his legs the expert now put the whole second story on the alarm charged three hundred dollars for it 
and went his way by and by one night i found a burglar in the third story about to start down a ladder with a lot of miscellaneous property my first impulse was to crack his head with a billiard cue but my second was to refrain from this attention because he was between me and the cue rack the second impulse was plainly the soundest so i refrained and proceeded to compromise i redeemed the property at formal rates after deducting ten per cent for use of ladder it being my ladder and next day we sent down for the expert once more and had the third story attached to the alarm for three hundred dollars by this time the annunciator had grown to formidable dimensions it had forty-seven tags on it marked with the names of the various rooms and chimneys and it occupied the space of an ordinary wardrobe the gong was the size of a washbowl and was placed above the head of our bed there was a wire from the house to the coachman's quarters in the stable and a noble gong alongside his pillar we should have been comfortable now but for one defect every morning at five the cook opened the kitchen door in the way of business and rip went that gong the first time this happened i thought the last day was come sure i didn't think it in bed no but out of it for the first effect of that frightful gong is to hurl you across the house and slam you against the wall and then curl you up and squirm you like a spider on a stove lid till somebody shuts the kitchen door in solid fact there is no clamor that is even remotely comparable to the dire clamor which that gong makes well this catastrophe happened every morning regular at five o'clock and lost us three hours sleep for mind you when that thing wakes you it doesn't merely wake you in spots it wakes you all over conscience and all and you are good for eighteen hours of wide awakeness subsequently eighteen hours of the very most inconceivable wide awakeness that you ever experienced in your life a stranger died in our hands one time and we vacated and left him in our room overnight did that stranger wait for the general judgment no sir he got up at five the next morning in the most prompt and unostentious way i knew he would i knew it mighty well he collected his life insurance and lived happy ever after for there was plenty of proof as to the perfect squareness of his death well we were gradually fading toward the better land on account of the daily loss of sleep so we finally had the expert up again and he ran a wire to the outside of the door and placed a switch there whereby thomas the butler always made one little mistake he switched the alarm off at night when he went to bed and switched it on again at daybreak in the morning just in time for the cook to open the kitchen door and enable that gong to slam us across the house sometimes breaking a window with one or the other of us at the end of a week we recognized that this switch business was a delusion and a snare we also discovered that a band of burglars had been lodging in the house the whole time not exactly to steal for there wasn't much left now but to hide from the police for they were hot pressed and they shrewdly judged that the detectives would never think of the tribe of burglars taking sanctuary in a house notoriously protected by the most imposing and elaborate burglar alarm in america sent down for the expert again and this time he struck a most dazzling idea he fixed the thing so that opening the kitchen door would take off the alarm it was a noble idea and he charged accordingly but you already foresee the result i switched on the alarm every night at bedtime no longer trusting on thomas's frail memory 
and as soon as the lights were out the burglars walked in at the kitchen door thus taking the alarm off without waiting for the cook to do it in the morning you see how aggravatingly we were situated for months we couldn't have any company not a spare bed in the house all occupied by burglars finally i got up a cure of my own the expert answered the call and ran another ground wire to the stable and established a switch there so that the coachman could put on and take off the alarm that worked first rate and a season of peace ensued during which we got to inviting company once more and enjoying life but by and by the irrepressible alarm invented a new kink one winter's night we were flung out of bed by the sudden music of that awful gong and when we hobbled to the annunciator turned up the gas and saw the word nursery exposed mrs mcwilliams fainted dead away and i came precious near doing the same thing myself i seized my shotgun and stood time in the coachman whilst that appalling buzzing went on i knew that his gong had flung him out too and that he would be along with his gun as soon as he could jump into his clothes when i judged that the time was ripe i crept into the room next to the nursery glanced through the window and saw the dim outline of the coachman in the yard below standing at present arms and waiting for a chance then i hopped into the nursery and fired and in the same instant the coachman fired at the red flash of my gun both of us were successful i crippled the nurse and he shot off all my back hair we turned up the gas and telephoned for a surgeon there was not a sign of a burglar and no window had been raised one glass was absent but that was where the coachman's charge had come through here was a fine mystery a burglar alarm going off at midnight of its own accord and not a burglar in the neighborhood the expert answered the usual call and explained that it was a false alarm said it was easily fixed so he overhauled the nursery window charged a remunerative figure for it and departed what we suffered from false alarms for the next three years no stylographic pen can describe during the next three months i always flew with my gun to the room indicated and the coachman always sallied forth with his battery to support me but there was never anything to shoot at windows all tied and secure we always sent down for the expert next day and he fixed those particular windows so they would keep quiet a week or so and always remembered to send us a bill about like this wire two dollars fifteen nipple seventy five two hours labor one fifty wax forty seven tape thirty four screws fifteen recharging battery ninety eight three hours labor two twenty five string two cents lard sixty six ponds extract one twenty five springs at fifty two dollars railroad fares seven twenty five at length a perfectly natural thing came about after we had answered three or four hundred false alarms to wit we stopped answering them yes i simply rose up calmly when slammed across the house by the alarm calmly inspected the annunciator took note of the room indicated and then calmly disconnected that room from the alarm and went back to bed as if nothing had happened moreover i left that room off permanently and did not send for the expert well it goes without saying that in the course of time all the rooms were taken off and the entire machine was out of service it was at this unprotected time that the heaviest calamity of all happened the burglars walked in one night and carried off the burglar alarm yes sir every hide and hair of it ripped it out tooth and nails springs bells gongs battery and all they took a hundred and fifty miles of copper wire they just cleaned her out bag and baggage and never left us a vestige of her to swear at swear by i mean 
We had a time of it to get her back, but we accomplished it finally for money. The alarm firm said that what we needed now was to have her put in right, with the new patent springs in the windows to make false alarms impossible, and their new patent clock attached to take off and put on the alarm morning and night without human assistance. That seemed a good scheme. They promised to have the whole thing finished in ten days. They began work, and we left for the summer. They worked a couple of days, then they left for the summer. After which the burglars moved in and began their summer vacation. When we returned in the fall, the house was as empty as a beer closet in premises where painters have been at work. We refurnished and then sent down to hurry up the expert. He came up and finished the job and said, Now this clock is set to put on the alarm every night at ten and take it off every morning at five forty-five. All you've got to do is to wind her up every week and then leave her alone. She will take care of the alarm herself. After that, we had a most tranquil season during three months. The bill was prodigious, of course, and I had said I would not pay it until the new machinery had proved itself to be flawless. The time stipulated was three months. So I paid the bill, and the very next day the alarm went to buzzing like ten thousand bee swarms at ten o'clock in the morning. I turned the hands around twelve hours, according to instructions, and this took off the alarm. But there was another hitch at night and I had to set her ahead twelve hours once more to get her to put the alarm on again. That sort of nonsense went on a week or two. Then the expert came up and put in a new clock. He came up every three months during the next three years and put in a new clock. But it was always a failure. His clocks all had the same perverse defect. They would put the alarm on in the daytime, and they would not put it on at night. And if you forced it on yourself, they would take it off again the minute your back was turned. Now, there is the history of that burglar alarm. Everything, just as it happened, nothing extenuated, and not set down in malice. Yes, sir. And when I had slept nine years with burglars, and maintained an expensive burglar alarm the whole time for their protection, not mine, and at my sole cost, not a dang cent could I ever get them to contribute. I just said to Mrs. McWilliams that I had had enough of that kind of pie. So with her full consent, I took the whole thing out and traded it off for a dog. And shot the dog. I don't know what you think about it, Mr. Twain, but I think those things are made solely in the interest of the burglars. Yes, sir. A burglar alarm combines in its person all that is objectionable about a fire, a riot, and a harem, and at the same time had none of the compensating advantages of one sort or another that customarily belong with that combination. Goodbye. I get off here. End of the McWilliamses and the Burglar Alarm. Recording by Scotty. The Movement from Tales of War by Lord Dunsinay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. The Movement by Lord Dunsinay. For many years, Elphes Griggs was comparatively silent. Not that he did not talk on all occasions whenever he could find hearers. He did that at great length. But for many years he addressed no public meeting, and was no part of the normal life of the northeast end of Hyde Park or Trafalgar Square. And then one day he was talking in a public house, where he had gone to talk on the only subject that was dear to him. He waited as was his custom, until five or six men were present, and then he began. 
you're all damned i say damned from the day you were born your portion is tophet and on that day there happened what had never happened in his experience before Men used to listen in a tolerant way, and say little over their beer, for that is the English custom, and that would be all. But today a man rose up with flashing eyes and went over to Elphaz, and gripped him by the hand. They're all damned, said the stranger. That was the turning point in the life of Elphaz. Up to that point he had been a lonely crank and men thought he was queer but now that there were two of them he became a movement a movement in england may do what it likes there was a movement before the war for spoiling tulips in kew gardens and breaking church windows it had its run like the rest the name of elphaz's new friend was ezekiel pym and they drew up rules for their movement almost at once and very soon country inns knew elphaz no more and for some while they missed him where he used to drop in of an evening and tell them that they were all damned and then a man proved one day that the earth was flat and they all forgot elphaz but elphaz went to hyde park and ezekiel pym went with him and there you could see them close to the marble arch on any fine sunday afternoon preaching their movement to the people of london you are all damned said elphaz your portion shall be damnation for everlasting all damned added ezekiel elphaz was the orator he would picture hell to you as it really is he made you see pretty much what it will be like to wriggle and turn and squirm and never escape from burning but ezekiel pym though he seldom said more than three words uttered those words with such alarming sincerity and had such a sure conviction shining in his eyes that searched right in your face as he said them and his long hair waved so weirdly as his head shot forward when he said you're all damned that ezekiel pym brought home to you that the vivid description of elphaz really applied to you people who had led bad lives get their sensibilities hardened these did not care much what elphaz said but girls at school and several governesses and even some young clergy were very much affected elphaz griggs and ezekiel pym seemed to bring hell so near to you you could almost feel it baking the marble arch from two to four on sundays and at four o'clock the surbiton branch of the international anarchists used to come along and elphaz griggs and ezekiel pym would pack up their flag and go for the pitch belonged to the surbiton people until six and the crank movements punctiliously recognized each other's rights if they fought among themselves which is quite unthinkable the police would run them in it is the one thing that an anarchist in england may never do when the war came the two speakers doubled their efforts the way they looked at it was that here was a counter attraction taking people's minds off the subject of their damnation just as they had got them to think about it elphaz worked as he had never worked before he spared nobody but it was still ezekiel pym who somehow brought it most home to them one fine spring afternoon elphaz griggs was speaking in his usual place and time he had wound himself up wonderfully you are damned he was saying for ever and ever and ever your sins have found you out your filthy lives will be as fuel round you and shall burn for ever and ever look here said a canadian soldier in the crowd they shouldn't allow that in ottawa what asked an english girl why telling us we're all damned like that he said oh this is england she said 
They may all say what they like here. You are all damned, said Ezekiel, jerking forward his head and shoulders until his hair flapped out behind. All, all, all damned. I'm damned if I am, said the Canadian soldier. Ah, said Ezekiel, and a sly look came onto his face. Elphaz flamed on. Your sins are remembered. Satan shall grin at you. He shall heap cinders on you for ever and ever. Woe to you, filthy livers. Woe to you, sinners. Hell is your portion. There shall be none to grieve for you. You shall dwell in torment for ages. None shall be spared. Not one. Woe everlasting. Oh, I beg pardon, gentlemen, I'm sure. For the pacifist league had been kept waiting three minutes. It was their turn today at four. End of The Movement by Lord Dunsinan Mr. and Mrs. Dove by Catherine Mansfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mr. and Mrs. Dove. Of course he knew, no man better, that he hadn't a ghost of a chance. He hadn't an earthly. The very idea of such a thing was preposterous so preposterous that he'd perfectly understand it if her father well whatever her father chose to do he'd perfectly understand in fact nothing short of desperation nothing short of the fact that this was positively his last day in england for god knows how long would have screwed him up to do it and even now he chose a tie out of the chest of drawers a blue and cream check tie and sat on the side of his bed supposing she replied what impertinence would he be surprised not in the least he decided turning up his soft collar and turning it down over the tie he expected her to say something like that he didn't see if he looked at the affair dead soberly what else she could say here he was and nervously he tied a bow in front of the mirror, jammed his hair down with both hands, pulled out the flaps of his jacket pockets. Making between five hundred and six hundred pounds a year on a fruit farm in, of all places, Rhodesia. No capital, not a penny coming to him, no chance of his income increasing for at least four years. As for looks and all that sort of thing, he was completely out of the running. He couldn't even boast of top-hole health, for the East Africa business had knocked him out so thoroughly that he'd had to take six months' leave. He was still fearfully pale, worse even than usual this afternoon, he thought, bending forward and peering into the mirror. Good heavens! What had happened? His hair looked almost bright green. Dash it all! He hadn't green hair at all events that was a bit too steep and then the green light trembled in the glass it was the shadow from the tree outside reggie turned away took out his cigarette case but remembering how the mater hated him to smoke in his bedroom put it back again and drifted over to the chest of drawers no he was dashed if he could think of one blessed thing in his favour while well, she <sighs> he stopped dead folded his arms, and leaned hard against the chest of drawers. And in spite of her position, her father's wealth, the fact that she was an only child and far and away the most popular girl in the neighbourhood, in spite of her beauty and her cleverness, cleverness, it was a great deal more than that. There was really nothing she couldn't do. He fully believed, had it been necessary, she would have been a genius at anything in spite of the fact that her parents adored her and she them and they'd as soon let her go all that way as in spite of every single thing you could think of so terrific was his love that he couldn't help hoping well was it hope 
or was this queer timid longing to have the chance of looking after her of making it his job to see that she had everything she wanted and that nothing came near her that wasn't perfect just love how he loved her he squeezed hard against the chest of drawers and murmured to it i love her i love her and just for the moment he was with her on the way to umtali it was night she sat in a corner asleep her soft chin was tucked into her soft collar her gold-brown lashes lay on her cheeks he doted on her delicate little nose her perfect lips her ear like a baby's and the gold-brown curl that half covered it they were passing through the jungle it was warm and dark and far away then she woke up and said have i been asleep and he answered yes are you all right here let me and he leaned forward to he bent over her this was such bliss that he could dream no further but it gave him the courage to bound downstairs to snatch his straw hat from the hall and to say as he closed the front door well i can only try my luck that's all but his luck gave him a nasty jar to say the least almost immediately promenading up and down the garden path with chinny and biddy the ancient peaks was the mater of course reginald was fond of the mater and all that she she meant well she had no end of grit and so on but there was no denying it she was rather a grim parent and there had been moments many of them in reggie's life before uncle alec died and left him the fruit farm when he was convinced that to be a widow's only son was about the worst punishment a chap could have and what made it rougher than ever was that she was positively all that he had she wasn't only a combined parent as it were but she had quarrelled with all her own and the governor's relations before reggie had won his first trouser pockets so that whenever reggie was homesick out there sitting on his dark veranda by starlight while the gramophone cried dear what is life but love his only vision was of the mater tall and stout rustling down the garden path with chinny and biddy at her heels the mater with her scissors outspread to snap the head of a dead something or other stopped at the sight of reggie you are not going out reginald she asked seeing that he was i'll be back for tea mater said reggie weakly plunging his hands into his jacket pockets snip off came a head reggie almost jumped i should have thought you could have spared your mother your last afternoon said she silence the peaks stared they understood every word of the mater's biddy lay down with her tongue poked out she was so fat and glossy she looked like a lump of half-melted toffee but chinny's porcelain eyes gloomed at reginald and he sniffed faintly as though the whole world were one unpleasant smell snip went the scissors again poor little beggars they were getting it and where are you going if your mother may ask asked the mater it was over at last but reggie did not slow down until he was out of sight of the house and halfway to colonel proctor's then only he noticed what a top hole afternoon it was it had been raining all the morning late summer rain warm heavy quick and now the sky was clear except for a long tail of little clouds like ducklings sailing over the forest there was just enough wind to shake the last drops off the trees one warm star splashed on his hand ping another drummed on his hat the empty road gleamed the hedges smelled of briar and how big and bright the hollyhocks glowed in the cottage gardens and here was colonel proctor's here it was already his hand was on the gate his elbow jogged the syringa bushes and petals and pollen scattered over his coat sleeve but wait a bit this was too quick altogether he'd meant to think the whole thing out again here steady but he was walking up the path with the huge rose bushes on either side 
it can't be done like this but his hand had grasped the bell given it a pull and started it peeling wildly as if he'd come to say the house was on fire the housemaid must have been in the hall too for the front door flashed open and reggie was shut in the empty drawing-room before that confounded bell had stopped ringing strangely enough when it did the big room shadowy with someone's parasol lying on top of the grand piano bucked him up or rather excited him it was so quiet and yet in one moment the door would open and his fate be decided the feeling was not unlike that of being at the dentist's he was almost reckless but at the same time to his immense surprise reggie heard himself saying lord thou knowest thou hast not done much for me that pulled him up that made him realize again how dead serious it was too late the door handle turned anne came in crossed the shadowy space between them gave him her hand and said in her small soft voice i'm so sorry father is out and mother is having a day in town hat hunting there's only me to entertain you reggie reggie gasped pressed his own hat to his jacket buttons and stammered out as a matter of fact i've only come to say good-bye oh cried anne softly she stepped back from him and her grey eyes danced what a very short visit then watching him her chin tilted she laughed outright a long soft peal and walked away from him over to the piano and leaned against it playing with the tassel of the parasol i'm so sorry she said to be laughing like this i don't know why i do it's just a bad ha habit and suddenly she stamped her grey shoe and took a pocket handkerchief out of her white woolly jacket i really must conquer it it's too absurd said she good heavens anne cried reggie i love to hear you laughing i can't imagine anything more but the truth was and they both knew it she wasn't always laughing it wasn't really a habit only ever since the day they'd met ever since that very first moment for some strange reason that reggie wished to god he understood anne had laughed at him why it didn't matter where they were or what they were talking about they might begin by being as serious as possible dead serious at any rate as far as he was concerned but then suddenly in the middle of a sentence anne would glance at him and a little quick quiver passed over her face her lips parted her eyes danced and she began laughing another queer thing about it was reggie had an idea she didn't herself know why she laughed he had seen her turn away frown suck in her cheeks press her hands together but it was no use the long soft peal sounded even while she cried i don't know why i'm laughing it was a mystery now she tucked the handkerchief away do sit down said she and smoke won't you there are cigarettes in that little box beside you i'll have one too he lighted a match for her and as she bent forward he saw the tiny flame glow in the pearl ring she wore it is to-morrow that you're going isn't it said anne yes to-morrow as ever was said reggie as he blew a little fan of smoke why on earth was he so nervous nervous wasn't the word for it it's it's frightfully hard to believe he added yes isn't it said anne softly and she leaned forward and rolled the point of her cigarette round the green ash-tray how beautiful she looked like that simply beautiful and she was so small in that immense chair reginald's heart swelled with tenderness but it was her voice her soft voice that made him tremble i feel like you've been here for years she said reginald took a deep breath of his cigarette it's ghastly this idea of going back he said kuru kuku ku sounded from the quiet but you're fond of being out there aren't you said anne she hooked her finger through her pearl necklace 
father was saying only the other night how lucky he thought you were to have a life of your own and she looked up at him reginald's smile was rather wan i don't feel fearfully lucky he said lightly roo coo 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 came again and anne murmured you mean it's lonely oh it isn't the loneliness i care about said reginald and he stumped his cigarette savagely on the green ash-tray i could stand any amount of it used to like it even it's the idea of suddenly to his horror he felt himself blushing rukukuku rukukuku anne jumped up come and say good-bye to my doves she said they've been moved to the side veranda you do like doves don't you reggie awfully said reggie so fervently that as he opened the french window for her and stood to one side anne ran forward and laughed at the doves instead to and fro to and fro over the fine red sand on the floor of the dove house walked the two doves one was always in front of the other one ran forward uttering a little cry and the other followed solemnly bowing and bowing you see explained anne the one in front she's mrs dove she looks at mr dove and gives that little laugh and runs forward and he follows her bowing and bowing and that makes her laugh again the way she runs and after her cried anne and she sat back on her heels comes poor mr dove bowing and bowing and that's their whole life they never do anything else you know she got up and took some yellow grains out of a bag on the roof of the dove house when you think of them out in rhodesia reggie you can be sure that is what they will be doing reggie gave no sign of having seen the doves or of having heard a word for the moment he was conscious only of the immense effort it took to tear his secret out of himself and offer it to anne anne do you think you could ever care for me it was done it was over and in the little pause that followed reginald saw the garden open to the light the blue quivering sky the flutter of leaves on the veranda poles and anne turning over the grains of maize on her palm with one finger then slowly she shut her hand and the new world faded as she murmured slowly no never in that way but he had scarcely time to feel anything before she walked quickly away and he followed her down the steps along the garden path under the pink rose arches across the lawn there with the gay herbaceous border behind him anne faced reginald it isn't that i'm not awfully fond of you she said i am but her eyes widened not in that way a quiver passed over her face one ought to be fond of her lips parted and she couldn't stop herself she began laughing there you see you see she cried it's your check tie even at this moment when one would think one would really be solemn your tie reminds me fearfully of the bow tie that cats wear in pictures oh please forgive me for being so horrid please reggie caught hold of her little warm hand there's no question of forgiving you he said quickly how could there be and i do believe i know why i make you laugh it's because you're so far above me in every way that i am somehow ridiculous i see that anne but if i were to no no anne squeezed his hand hard it's not that that's all wrong i'm not far above you at all you're much better than i am you're marvellously unselfish and and kind and simple i'm none of those things you don't know me i'm the most awful character said anne please don't interrupt and besides that's not the point the point is she shook her head i couldn't possibly marry a man i laughed at surely you see that the man i marry breathed anne softly she broke off she drew her hand away and looking at reggie she smiled strangely dreamily the man i marry 
and it seemed to Reggie that a tall, handsome, brilliant stranger stepped in front of him and took his place, the kind of man that Anne and he had seen often at the theatre, walking on to the stage from nowhere, without a word catching the heroine in his arms, and after one long, tremendous look, carrying her off to anywhere. Reggie bowed to his vision. "'Yes, I see,' he said huskily. "'Do you?' said Anne. "'Oh, I do hope you do, because I feel so horrid about it. It's so hard to explain. You know I've never—' She stopped. Reggie looked at her. She was smiling. "'Isn't it funny?' she said. "'I can say anything to you. I always have been able to from the very beginning.' He tried to smile, to say, I'm glad. She went on. I've never known anyone I like as much as I like you. I've never felt so happy with anyone. But I'm sure it's not what people and what books mean when they talk about love. Do you understand? Oh, if you only knew how horrid I feel. But we'd be like, like Mr. and Mrs. Dove. That did it. That seemed to Reginald final and so terribly true that he could hardly bear it. "'Don't drive it home,' he said, and he turned away from Anne and looked across the lawn. There was the gardener's cottage, with the dark ilex tree beside it. A wet blue thumb of transparent smoke hung above the chimney. It didn't look real. How his throat ached! Could he speak? He had a shot. "'I must be getting along home.' he croaked, and he began walking across the lawn. But Anne ran after him. "'No, don't! You can't go yet,' she said imploringly. "'You can't possibly go away feeling like that.' And she stared up at him, frowning, biting her lip. "'Oh, that's all right,' said Reggie, giving himself a shake. "'I'll—I'll—' And he waved his hand as much to say, "'Get over it.' "'But this is awful,' said Anne. She clasped her hands and stood in front of him. "'Surely you do see how fatal it would be for us to marry, don't you?' "'Oh, quite, quite,' said Reggie, looking at her with haggard eyes. "'How wrong, how wicked, feeling as I do. I mean, it's all very well for Mr. and Mrs. Dove, but imagine that in real life. Imagine it!' "'Oh, absolutely,' said Reggie, and he started to walk on. But again Anne stopped him. She tugged at his sleeve, and to his astonishment, this time, instead of laughing, she looked like a little girl who was going to cry. "'Then why, if you understand, are you so unhappy?' she wailed. "'Why do you mind so fearfully? Why do you look so awful?' Reggie gulped, and again he waved something away. "'I can't help it,' he said. I've had a blow. If I cut off now, I'll be able to— How can you talk of cutting off now? said Anne scornfully. She stamped her foot at Reggie. She was crimson. How can you be so cruel? I can't let you go until I know for certain that you are just as happy as you were before you asked me to marry you. Surely you must see that. It's so simple. But it did not seem at all simple to Reginald. It seemed impossibly difficult. "'Even if I can't marry you, how can I know that you're all that way away "'with only that awful mother to write to, and that you're miserable, and that it's all my fault?' "'It's not your fault. Don't think that. It's just fate.' "'Reggie took her hand off his sleeve and kissed it. "'Don't pity me, dear little Anne,' he said gently. "'And this time he nearly ran, under the pink arches, along the garden path. Rook -coo -coo -coo. Rook-coo-coo-coo, sounded from the veranda. Reggie, Reggie, from the garden. He stopped. He turned, but when she saw his timid, puzzled look, she gave a little laugh. Come back, Mr. Dove, said Anne, and Reginald came slowly across the lawn. End of Mr. and Mrs. Dove by Catherine Mansfield Nigore, the Coward, from Love of Life and Other Stories by Jack London.
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Nigore the Coward by Jack London. He had followed the trail of his fleeing people for eleven days, and his pursuit had been, in itself, a flight. For behind him he knew full well were the dreaded Russians, toiling through the swampy lowlands and over the steep divides, bent on no less than the extermination of his people. He was traveling light, a rabbit-skinned sleeping robe, a muzzle-loading rifle, and a few pounds of sun-dried salmon constituted his outfit. He would have marveled that the whole people, women and children and aged, could travel so swiftly had he not known the terror that drove them on. It was in the old days of the Russian occupancy of Alaska, when the nineteenth century had run but half its course, that Nagore fled after his fleeing tribe, and came upon it this summer night by the headwaters of the Pelai. Though near the midnight hour it was bright day as he passed through the weary camp. Many saw him, all knew him, but few and cold were the greetings he received. Nigori, the coward, he heard Iliha, a young woman, laugh, and son Ni, his sister's daughter, laugh with her. Black anger aided his heart, but he gave no sign, threading his way among the campfires, until he came to one where sat an old man. A young woman was kneading with skillful fingers the tired muscles in his legs. He raised a sightless face and listened intently as Nagori's foot cracked on a dead twig. Who comes? he queried in a thin, tremulous voice. Nigore, said the young woman, scarcely looking up from her task. Nigore's face was expressionless. For many minutes he stood and waited. The old man's head had sunken back upon his chest. The young woman pressed and prodded the wasted muscles, resting her body on her knees, her bowed head hidden as in a cloud by her black wealth of hair. Nagori watched the supple body, bending at the hips as a lynx's body might bend, pliant as a young willow stock, and, withal, strong as only youth is strong. He looked, and was aware of a great yearning, akin in sensation to physical hunger. At last he spoke, saying, Is there no greeting for Nagore, who has been long gone, and has but now come back? She looked up at him with cold eyes. The old man chuckled to himself after the manner of the old. Thou art my woman, Uuna, Nagori said, his tones dominant, conveying a hint of menace. She arose with cat-like ease and suddenness to her full height, her eyes flashing, her nostrils quivering like a deer's. I was thy woman to be, Nagore. But thou art a coward. The daughter of old Kinuus mates not with a coward. She silenced him with an imperious gesture as he strove to speak. Old Kinuus and I came among you from a strange land. Thy people took us in by their fires and made us warm, not asked whence or why we wandered. It was their thought that old Kinuus had lost the sight of his eyes from age. Nor did old Kanu'us say otherwise, nor did I, his daughter. Old Kanu'us was a brave man, but old Kanu'us was never a boaster. And now, when I tell thee how his blindness came to be, thou wilt know beyond question that the daughter of Kanu'us cannot mother the child of a coward, such as thou art, Nagore. She again silenced the speech that rushed up to his tongue. No, Nagore, if journey be added unto journey of all thy journeyings through this land, thou wouldst not come to the unknown Sitka on the great salt sea. In that place there be many Russian folks. Their rule is harsh. And from Sitka, old Kanu'us, who was young Kanu'us in those days, fled away with me, a baby in his arms, among the islands in the midst of the sea. My mother dead tells the tale of his wrong, a Russian 
dead with a spear through the breast and back, tells the tale of the vengeance of Canoos. But wherever we fled, and however far we fled, always did we find the hated Russian folk. Canoos was unafraid, but the sight of them was a hurt to his eyes. So we fled on and on, through the seas and years, till we came to the great fog sea, Nagore, of which thou hast heard, but which thou hast never seen. We lived among many peoples, and I grew to be a woman. But Canoos grew old, took to him no other women, nor did I take a man. At last we came to Pastolet, which is where the Yukon drowns itself in the great fog sea. Here we lived long, on the rim of the sea, among a people by whom the Russians were well hated. But sometimes they came, these Russians, in great ships, and made the people of Pastolet show them the way through the islands uncountable of the many-mouthed Yukon. And sometimes the men they took to show them the way never came back, until the people became angry and planned a great plan. So, when there came a ship, Old Canoe stepped forward and said he would show the way. He was an old man then, and his hair was white, but he was unafraid. And he was cunning, for he took the ships to where the sea sucks into the land, and the waves beat white on the mountain called Romanoff. The sea sucked the ships into where the waves beat white, and it ground upon the rocks and broke open its sides. Then came all the people of Pastolik, for this was the plan, with their war spears and arrows and some few guns. But first the Russians put out the eyes of old Canoos, that he may never show the way again. And then they fought, where the waves beat white, with the people of Pastolik. Now the headman of these Russians was Ivan. He it was, with his two thumbs, who drove out the eyes of Canoos. He it was, who fought his way through the white water, with two men left of all his men, and went along the rim of the great fog sea into the north. Canoos was wise. He could see no more, and was helpless as a child. So he fled away from the sea, up the great strange Yukon, even to Nulato, and I fled with him. This was the deed my father did, Canoos, an old man. But how did the young man, Negore? Once again she silenced him. With my own eyes I saw, at Nulato, before the gates of the great fort, but a few days gone. I saw the Russian Ivan, who thrust out my father's eyes, lay the lash of his dog-whip upon thee, and beat thee like a dog. This I saw, and knew thee for a coward. But I saw thee not, that night, when all thy people, yea, even the boys not yet hunters, fell upon the Russians and slew them. Not Ivan, said Nigor quietly. Even now is he on our heels, and with him many Russians, fresh up from the sea. Uuna made no effort to hide her surprise, and chagrin that Ivan was not dead, but went on. In the day I saw thee a coward, in the night when all men fought, even the boys not yet hunters, I saw thee not, and knew ye doubly a coward. Thou art done, all done, Nigore asked. She nodded her head, and looked at him askance, as though astonished that he should have aught to say. "'Know, then, that Nigore is no coward,' he said, and his speech was very low and quiet. "'Know that when I was yet a boy I journeyed alone down to the place where the Yukon drowns itself in the great fog sea. Even to Pastolik I journeyed, even beyond, into the north, along the rim of the sea.' This I did when I was a boy, and I was no coward. Nor was I a coward when I journeyed a young man and alone up the Yukon further than man had ever been, so far that I came to another folk with white faces, who lived in a great fort and talked a speech other than that the Russians talk. Also have I killed the great bear of the Tanana country, where no one of my people hath ever been. And I have fought with the Nukyaklets, 
and the caltags and the sticks in far regions ever i and alone these deeds whereof no man knows i speak of myself let my people speak for me of things i have done which they know they will not say nigore is a coward he finished proudly and proudly waited these be things which happened before i came into the land she said and i know not of them only do i know what i know and i know i saw thee lashed like a dog in the day and in the night when the great fort flamed red and the men killed and were killed i saw thee not also thy people do call thee nigore the coward it is thy name now nigore the coward it is not a good name old canoes chuckled thou dost not understand Kinuus, Nagori said gently, but I shall make thee understand. Know that I was away on the hunt of the bear with Kamota, my mother's son. And Kamota fought with the great bear. We had no meat for three days, and Kamota was not strong of arm or swift of foot. And the great bear crushed him, so, till his bones cracked like dry sticks. Thus I found him, very sick and groaning upon the ground. And there was no meat, nor could I kill aught that a sick man might eat. So I said, I will go to Nulato and bring thee food, also strong men to carry thee to camp. And Kamota said, Go thou to Nulato and get food, but say no word of what has befallen me. And when I have eaten, and am grown well and strong, I will kill this bear. Then will I return in honor to Nulato, and no man may laugh and say, Kamota was undone by a bear. So I gave heed to my brother's words. And when I came to Nulato, and the Russian Ivan laid the lash of his dog whip upon me, I knew I must not fight. For no man knew of Kamota, sick and groaning and hungry. And did I fight with Ivan? and die then would my brother die too so it was Uuna, that thou sawest me beaten like a dog then i heard the talk of the shamans and chiefs that the russians had brought strange sicknesses upon the people and killed our men and stolen our women and that the land must be made clean as i said i heard the talk and i knew it for good talk and I knew that in the night the Russians were to be killed. But there was my brother, Kamota, sick and groaning with no meat, so I could not stay and fight with the men and the boys not yet hunters. And I took with me meat and fish, and the lash marks of Ivan, and I found Kamota no longer groaning, but dead. Then I went back to Nulato, and behold, there was no Nulato only ashes where the great fort had stood and the bodies of many men and i saw the russians come up the yukon in boats fresh from the sea many russians and i saw ivan creep forth from where he lay and make talk with them and the next day i saw ivan lead them upon the trail of the tribe even now they are upon the trail and i am here negore but no coward this is a tale i hear said una though her voice was gentler than before kamota is dead and cannot speak for thee and i know only what i know and i must know thee of my own eyes for no coward negore made an impatient gesture there will be ways and ways she added art thou willing to do no less than old kinus hath done he nodded his head and waited as thou hast said they seek for us even now these russians show them the way nigore even as old kinuus showed them the way so that they may come unprepared to where we wait for them in the passage up the rocks thou knowest the place where the wall is broken and high then will we destroy them even ivan when they cling like flies to the wall 
and the top is no less near than the bottom, our men shall fall upon them from above and either side, with spears and arrows and guns, and the women and children from above shall loosen the great rocks and hurl them down upon them. It will be a great day, for the Russians will be killed, and the land will be made clean, and Ivan, even Ivan, who thrust out my father's eyes, and laid the lash of his dog-whip upon thee, will be killed. Like a dog gone mad, he will die, his breath crushed out of him beneath the rocks. And when the fighting begins, it is for thee, Nigore, to crawl secretly away, so that thou be not slain. Even so, he answered, Nigore will show them the way. And then? And then I shall be thy woman, Nigore's woman and the brave man's wife, and thou shalt hunt meat for me, an old canoes, and I shall cook thy food, and sew three warm parkas and strong, and make three moccasins after the way of my people, which is a better way than the people's way. And as I said, I shall be thy woman, Nagore, always thy woman, and I shall make thy life glad for thee, so that all thy days will be a song and laughter and thou wilt know the woman Uuna as unlike all other women, for she has journeyed far, and lived in strange places, and is wise in the ways of men, and in the ways they may be made glad. And in thy old age will she still make thee glad, and thy memory of her in the days of thy strength will be sweet, and thou wilt know always that she was ease to thee, and peace and rest, and that beyond all women to other men has she been a woman to thee. Even so, said Nagore, and the hunger for her ate at his heart, and his arms went out for her, as a hungry man's arms might go out for food. When thou hast shown the way, Nagore, she chided him, but her eyes were soft and warm, and he knew she looked upon him as a woman had never looked before. It is well, he said, turning resolutely on his heel. I go now to make talk with the chiefs, so that they may know I am gone to show the Russians the way. O oh, Nigore, my man, my man, she said to herself, as she watched him go. But she said it so softly that even old Canuus did not hear, and his ears were over keen, what with his blindness. Three days later, having with craft ill-concealed his hiding-place, Nagore was dragged forth like a rat, and brought before Ivan, Ivan the Terrible, as he was known by the men who marched at his back. Nagore was armed with a miserable bone-barbed spear, and he kept his rabbit-skin robe wrapped closely about him, and though the day was warm, he shivered as if with ague. He shook his head that he did not understand the speech Ivan put at him, and made that he was very weary and sick, and wished only to sit down and rest, pointing the while to his stomach in sign of his sickness, and shivering fiercely. But Ivan had a man from Pastelik who talked the speech of Nagore, and many and vain were the questions they asked him concerning his tribe, till the man from Pastelik, who was called Karduk, said, It is the word of Ivan that thou shalt be lashed till thou diest, if thou dost not speak. And know, strange brother, when I tell thee the word of Ivan is the law, that I am thy friend and no friend of Ivan. For I come not willingly from my country by the sea, and I desire greatly to live. Therefore I obey the will of my master, as thou wilt obey, strange brother, if thou art wise, and wouldst live. Nay, strange brother, Nagori answered, I know not the way my people are gone, for I was sick, and they fled so fast my legs gave out from under me, and I fell behind. Nagori waited until Karduk talked with Ivan. Then Nagori saw the Russian's face go dark, and he saw the men step to either side of him, snapping the lashes of their whips. 
whereupon he betrayed a great fright and cried aloud that he was a sick man and knew nothing but would tell what he knew and with such purpose did he tell that ivan gave the word to his men to march and on either side of nagori marched the men with the whips that he might not run away and when he made that he was weak of his sickness and stumbled and walked not so fast as they walked they laid their lashes upon him till he screamed with pain and discovered new strength and when kardak told him all would be well with him when they had overtaken his tribe he answered and then may i rest and move not continually he asked and when may i rest and move not and while he appeared very sick and looked about him with dull eyes he noted the fighting strength of ivan's men and noted with satisfaction that ivan did not recognize him as the man he had beaten before the gates of the fort it was a strange following his dull eyes saw there were slavonian hunters fair-skinned and mighty-muscled short squat fins with flat noses and round faces siberian half-breeds whose noses were more like eagle beaks and lean slant-eyed men who bore in their veins the mongol and tartar blood as well as the blood of the slav wild adventurers they were forayers and destroyers from the far lands beyond the sea of bering who blasted the new and unknown world with fire and sword and clutched greedily for its wealth of fur and hide nagori looked upon them with satisfaction and in his mind's eye he saw them crushed and lifeless at the passage up the rocks and ever he saw waiting for him at the passage up the rocks the face and form of Una, and ever he heard her voice in his ears and felt the soft warm glow of her eyes and never did he forget to shiver nor to stumble when the footing was rough nor to cry aloud at the bite of the lash also he was afraid of Karduk, for he knew him for no true man he was a false eye and an easy tongue a tongue way too easy he judged for the awkwardness of honest speech all day they marched and on the next when Karduk asked him at command of ivan he said he doubted they would meet with his tribe till the morrow but ivan who had once been shown the way by old canoes and had found that way to lead through the white water and the deadly fight believed no more in anything so when they came to a passage up the rocks he halted his forty men and through Karduk demanded if the way were clear nagori looked at it shortly and carelessly it was a vast slide that broke the straight wall of the cliff and was overrun with brush and creeping plants where a score of tribes could have lain well hidden he shook his head nay there be nothing there he said the way is clear again ivan spoke to Karduk, and Karduk said no my strange brother if thy talk be not straight and if thy people block the way and fall upon ivan and his men that thou shalt die and at once my talk is straight nagore said the way is clear still ivan doubted and ordered two of his slavonian hunters to go up alone two other men he ordered to the side of nagore they placed their guns against his breast and waited all waited and nagore knew should one arrow fly or one spear be flung that his death would come upon him the two slavonian hunters coiled upward until they grew smaller and smaller and when they reached the top they waved their hats that all was well they were like black specks against the sky the guns were lowered from nagori's breast and ivan gave the order for his men to go forward ivan was silent lost in thought for an hour he marched as though puzzled and then through Karduk's mouth he said to nagori how didst thou know the way was clear when thou didst look so briefly upon it nagore thought of the little birds he had seen perched among the rocks and upon the bushes and smiled it was so simple but he shrugged his shoulders and made no answer 
for he was thinking likewise of another passage up the rocks to which they would soon come and where the little birds would all be gone and he was glad that Karduk came from the great fog sea where there were no trees or bushes and where men learned watercraft instead of land crafts and woodcraft three hours later when the sun rose overhead they came to another passage up the rocks and Karduk said look with all thine eyes strange brother and see if the way be clear for ivan is not minded this time to wait while the men go up before nagori looked and he looked with two men by his side their guns resting upon his breast he saw that the little birds were all gone and once he saw the glint of sunlight on a rifle barrel and he thought of oonu and of her words and when the fighting begins it is for thee nagore to crawl secretly away so that thou be not slain he felt the two guns pressed against his breast this was not the way she had planned there would be no crawling secretly away he would be the first to die when the fighting began but he said and his voice was steady and he still feigned to see the dull eyes and to shiver from his sickness the way is clear and they started up ivan and his forty men from the far lands beyond the sea of bering and there was karduk the man from pastolik and negore with the two guns always upon him it was a long climb and they could not go fast but very fast to negore they seemed to approach the midway point where top was no less near than bottom a gun cracked among the rocks to the right and nagore heard the war yell of all his tribe and for an instant saw the rocks and bushes bristle alive with his kinfolk then he felt torn asunder by a burst of flame hot through his being and as he fell he knew the sharp pangs of life as it wrenches at the flesh to be free but he gripped his life with a miser's clutch and would not let it go he still breathed the air which bit his lungs with a painful sweetness and dimly he saw and heard with passing spells of blindness and deafness the flashes of sight and sound again wherein he saw the hunters of ivan fall to their deaths and his own brothers fringing the carnage and filling the air with a tumult of their cries and weapons and far above the women and children loosing the great rocks that leapt like things alive and thundered down the sun danced above him in the sky the huge walls reeled and swung and still he heard and saw dimly and when the great ivan fell across his legs hurled there lifeless and crushed by downrushing rock he remembered the blind eyes of old kanush and was glad then the sounds died down and the rocks no longer thundered past and he saw his tribe people creeping close and closer spearing the wounded as they came and near to him he heard the scuffle of a mighty slavonian hunter loath to die and half uprisen borne back and down by the thirsting spears then he saw above him the face of uuna and felt about him the arms of uuna and for a moment the sun steadied and stood still and the great walls were upright and moved not thou art a brave man nagore he heard her say in his ear thou art my man nagore and in that moment he lived all the life of gladness of which she had told him and the laughter and the song and as the sun went out of the sky above him as in his old age he knew the memory of her was sweet and as ever the memories dimmed and died in the darkness that fell upon him he knew in her arms the fulfillment of all the ease and rest she had promised him and as the black night wrapped around him his head upon her breast he felt a great peace steal about him and he was aware of the hush of many twilights and the mystery of silence End of Negore the Coward by Jack London